Amen. Amen. Welcome. Welcome to Antioch Baptist Church. I guess I will get up here. I don't know exactly where the video is. I want to make sure I'm in the camera. Welcome to Antioch. It's homecoming. It's homecoming. Amen. Hallelujah. We want to tell everybody that this is about coming back to the Lord. Right? It's not just Antioch. We're glad you came to Antioch, but we want you to come back. To the Lord every week and we pray that you come back to the Lord every day and you wake up every morning asking the Lord how to follow and how to serve him better but this morning we're going to have a great band lead us in worship we're also going to have a great meal we're going to have great fellowship afterwards and have a little meeting in between so this morning the slides we're going to have our meal I want to also remind you that you can get your baby bottles back. Last but not least, we're going to invite you all to a worship night, August the 12th, and a cookout the next day. If you're part of the discipleship ministries and hear your deacon nominations, 
You can check those out. We can talk about that later. And now we're going to pray because it's time to get ready to worship. God, we thank you so much for another homecoming. We thank you that you call us to yourself, that you are that father who has an everlasting love, that you open up your arms wide, that you forgive your children no matter what we've done. As far as the east is from the west, that's how far you have removed our sins and our iniquities and our transgressions. So, God, we're so thankful that we get to be called your children. And we ask right now that you would lead us in worship, that you would allow us to open up our hearts, that we would receive something that's from you. Send your spirit. Help us to remember the death burial, resurrection, and awesome power that your great son has. And God, get us ready, because one day you're coming back. And this homecoming is just a reflection of what will be when you come back and when you crack the sky. So God, we ask right now that you would prepare us for that day, for that great homecoming that is coming. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right, we're going to do a great little hymn here. And it's fitting for this morning. It's called I'll Fly Away. Well, some bright morning when this life is over, I Celestial shores, I'll fly away. Come on, sing it with us. I'll fly away, oh glory. I'll fly away. When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. Come on, dear. Prison walls, I'll fly, I'll fly away. I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away. When I die, hallelujah, by and by, I'll fly away. How about it?
Yeah, so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> now, this little next song we're going to do here is uh, it's pretty dear to my heart. It's the first gospel song I believe I ever learned. My grandfather taught it to me. So, uh, it's, a, it's a pretty song. It talks about a, a little white church out in the valley. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a good song. Good song. Whenever you think, Jerry. Oh, well, a little pep to it. Not too much, though. <laughs> yeah, not, not too fast. It's Sunday morning. Don't go too fast. There's a little white church in the valley That stands in my memory each day And it seems I can hear the bells now ringing Though I am many miles away And many times in church on Sunday morning The whole countryside would gather there We'd all kneel down by the altar as they lifted up our voices in prayer Oh, that church in the valley That little white church is the place I love so well Now I'm sad and lonely Yes, I'm sad and lonely For that little white church in the Troubles all are ended, and happy forever they will be. They're all waiting and watching up yonder at the coming home of you and me. Oh, that church in the valley, that little white church is the place I love so well. Now I'm sad and lonely, yes, I'm sad and lonely for that little church in the That little white church is a place I love so well. Now I'm sad and lonely. Yes, I'm sad and lonely for that little white church in the dead. Yes, I'm sad and lonely. Yes, I'm sad and lonely for that little white church in the dead. Appreciate it so much. Thank you guys for having us out to worship the Lord this morning in his house. So we just appreciate it. Uh, it's, we're just grateful to be here. And um, we're going to uh, sing one more, but we're going to take up an offering before we do. Uh, if you have the ushers come forward to come take up the offering. So this next song we're going to do, uh, this is a kind of a near and dear to my heart as well. Uh, talks about 
once being lost, but then being found. So there's been many times in my life I walked around lost, but was glad the day Jesus found me. So, well, let's go ahead and pray over the offering here. Heavenly Father, Lord, thank you for today. We thank you for all that you've done for us, Lord. We just pray, Lord, you take this offering and use it, Lord, to the nourishment of this church, Father, and you just use it as you see fit, Lord. Just bless each one that's able to give and the ones that are not able to give, Lord. Just watch over us, keep us safe as we go home, and help us to have a, a great day in fellowship this morning, Lord. We love you and thank you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. You want to go ahead, brother? They wanted one extra announcement. This, this offering, if you want it to go to the cemetery committee, you need to write it on your checks. So if you want the offering to go to the cemetery committee, please put a memo on your check. Thank you. All right, thank you, brother. We thank you so much for the opportunity to come to your house. We thank you for great music, God, for reminders of how you are coming back and how we can be ready. So, God, we ask right now that you would turn our attentions to your word. Let your will be done. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. All right. As we continue to worship, this Sunday we're going to continue our service, our sermon series in Romans. We're not changing anything. It's Romans chapter 12, and we're continuing to look at how God is calling us to share the gospel with everybody. And what a fine time to talk about the gospel and how it needs to be shared with everyone at home coming. See, in my tradition, homecoming a lot of times was when people who may have gone to another church or may have started fellowship in somewhere else decided to go back to the place where they first 
received Christ, where they first started following after the Lord. So that's a beautiful thing that some folks are coming back to Antioch for the first time because you've been fellowshipping somewhere else. And so we're happy to have the family grow. There's also some folks who are coming back for the first time. And, and last Sunday and the Sunday before that and the Sunday before that, they didn't fellowship with anybody. And this is a time for us to be able to say, you know what, no matter where you've been, no matter what you've been doing, we're happy that you came back home. And so I just, I just want to say that. Some of y'all don't, don't know me. It's been so long. You say, when did that man get here? So I've been here for a year. So I just want to tell you, you missed, you've been missing some stuff. But, uh, and we've been missing you, and we're happy that you're back. And even if this is your first time visiting, I, I met a young lady. It was her first time coming. I'm going to have to move some of this stuff because I like to move when I preach Hallelujah. Y'all know you can't even keep me on the camera. I said, I'm going to move some of this stuff. I have a conniption. But I, I just want to say that I met somebody, and it's their first time coming, and said, the Holy Spirit. I said, what brought you here? And then the Holy Spirit revealed it. The Holy Spirit is what brought each of us here. So we want to thank the Lord that the Holy Spirit sent us here this morning. And we're here because God wants us to be here. But you know what? Some of us, we haven't gone to church in a while. And he brought us this morning so we would be part of this fellowship and we would be part of this family. And we want to tell you the same thing we've been telling everybody. We're getting ready to go home. We're, I mean, each and every Sunday, each and every day of our lives, we're trying to get ready for Christ's return. And so as we turn back to Romans, so that was all of the introduction you're going to get. As we turn back to Romans chapter 12, verse 18, it says, if possible. On your part, live at peace with everyone. Friends, do not avenge yourself. Instead, leave room for God's wrath. For it is written, vengeance belongs to me. I will repay, says the Lord. I like this part. But if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him something to drink for in so doing you will be heaping fiery coals on his head 21 says do not be conquered by evil but conquer evil with good let us pray god we thank you so much that you've given us everything that we need to live at peace you gave us your Holy Spirit and your Son, Jesus, and you are working through us, and you want us to love one another. You want us to care for one another, and that's oftentimes going to look like forgiveness. So many times we're going to have to have mercy. We're going to have to say, I'm sorry, and mean it. We're going to have to pray because we've been offended. And God, so many of the times giving like you is going to mean that we get our feelings hurt. The people say things that we don't want to hear. God, you got to teach us how to grow up in you, how to forgive, how to keep moving closer and closer and closer to our brothers and sisters. Because you want us to be together, not just in the new heaven and the new earth, but right here and right now. So we thank you that we're getting ready to go home, but we thank you that you've brought us to homecoming. So whatever you're going to do in the new heavens and the new earth, start doing it right now. This day, this very moment, for all of your children who you love with an everlasting love, it's in Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. You know, I always like to pray that when I preach that I would decrease and that the Holy Spirit would increase, that the God and Father who knows you perfectly would be the one who talks to you. Because I mean, I don't know some of y'all's first or last name, but God knows every hair on your head. Ain't that an amazing thing? So I, I, I hope and pray, as we were talking about it this morning, I was talking to Heath, and he was talking about how some people are able to play with just the amps behind them and what have you. And I said, when I sing, it's easy for me to just sing because I know I'm God's instrument. Right, and he's the one. If I'm out of tune, is he ask him to tune me? And so I mean, like I, 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 I'm his instrument. So I'm asking you right now. I'm praying that as I'm delivering this word, that I would be God's instrument. But I also pray that you would be 
his instrument that we would move. Now, we were concerned this morning that because we didn't have words that this would just be an audience. But I, I'm telling you, y'all were singing this morning. Y'all were worshiping this morning. We're going to keep on. We got to keep on worshiping. Now, don't, don't get dry now. You were trying to worship the Lord a minute ago. Now, keep on worshiping the Lord. Now, this morning, we're talking about getting ready to go home. It's, this is a happy, joyous occasion. So let's all be happy, right? Now, the first point that I have, and I'll talk to you about it, and I go through the passage. My wife told me I needed to explain what I do. Now, I'm just going to tell you, this is what I do. I like to look at almost every word in the passage and start to understand what the words mean. I, mean, I take a lot of the Bible for granted, and I just assume I know to understand it. But then I start looking up the words, and I said, I didn't know that was in there. And so I, that I'm just giving you the overflow of what God gives me. He tells me to spend weeks in study. Travis asked me about preaching this months ago. I've been oh, so on fire for this word. I'm so happy that I finally get to deliver it, and then we'll have to move on to the next thing. But I'm so glad that when we talk about going home, we start with this, live at peace right now. You're going home one day, but you got to learn to live at peace right now. It says, if possible. Verse 18 says, if possible. This word possible is power. Did you know that? It sounds like a little, just a passing phrase, if possible. It says, if you have the power. This is the same word we use for dynamite. If you have all of that combustion, if you have all of that strength, this is mighty and strong. If you have that diligence. When I ran the pregnancy centers, the passage that always came up to me was Proverbs 24.10. And it says, if you falter, in a day of trouble, how strong is your strength? See, we, when we talk about the power, if possible, we're saying when it's hard, when it's difficult. We're talking about living at peace. We all know it's possible to live at peace when everybody's nice, when everybody's doing exactly, when everything runs smoothly, it's easy to have peace. If people are catering to you, oh, isn't it easy if they wake up and they say, what would you like? You love that. But what about this, if possible, do you have the power to do your part? This, if possible, your part is as or whatever depends on you. What about when the other person is so hard to get along with? See, now that's where we, we, let's go ahead and start that. If possible, some people may be here this morning because they left the church because somebody was so hard to get along with. Ooh, isn't that a hard thing? That's a hard thing. I've been at churches. I bet you I've been the person that was so hard to get along with. So before we get too far thinking about the other person, let's start with saying if it's our part, because I say it like this, in a relationship, a lot of times we're looking at it and we're so happy when people are catering to us, but sometimes it's our season to be the one to bear with. Right? When we say it, we take marriage vows, we say for good or for bad, but we really mean please make it as many good as possible. All right, we don't say, like, I, I'm, I'm willing to have just as many bad as good. You know, if every Tuesday is bad, that's fine, because, you know, every Wednesday is good. That's not what we're saying. So when it's your part, you got to do all that depends on you. That's what I love about the Bible. Jesus Christ tells us to do this. He says, love. And he said, we said it last week, love your enemies. Your part is to love regardless of the other. See, love is the commandment. It's not the thing that you should go looking for. You got to assume in this world that people are going to be not peaceful. We say live at peace because most of the time it's not peaceful. We got to tell you to do your part because most of the time other people are not doing their part. And every time we come to church, we can say what this person didn't do and what that person didn't do. Or we can even say that person should be doing this or that person should be doing that. But that's not what this says. It says you got power. The same power that God exerted in sending the Holy Spirit to raise Jesus up from the dead is what he gave you to forgive your neighbor. That's the power. Or to pick up some trash. That's the power. Or to be like whatever it is. He gave you the power to do each and every one of those things. To change a dirty diaper and to be nice to somebody who's rude to you. To just say good morning. Man, how many people did you not greet this morning as you were coming in? And why? 
That's just that he gave us live at peace. We got to do a little bit extra. That's a hard one, right? What were we doing? We just had a seat we had to hurry up and get to. All right, I have watched this. I, let me tell you what's so funny. I have been up there playing the guitar, and I've watched someone take my bag and move my bag. I put my bag there to save a seat, so y'all know. And I, I, I saved my wife's seat, and I got want to have my wife and my family, and I watched somebody come in, and they picked up my bag, and they looked around, and they moved my bag over, and I watched it, and I love these people. The people who did it, I watched, and I giggled, and I watched the husband say, don't move his bag. And she said, I'm sitting right here. And I watched the people. I watched the people. And I'm sitting up there, and I'm about to sing a song. And I mean, the, the, some started stirring up in me. And God had to remind me, it's like, those people love you. They're nice to you. Sir, I can sit somewhere else. That's not that big of a deal. But living at peace is hard because every little thing, every, I mean, as we're in the body and the family of Christ, something can irk you. Something can get on your nerves. That's why we're saying if it's possible, you got to do everything possible. But here's the question. Is it in you? If the Holy Spirit is in you, then it's in you. That's why I asked that question. Because if it, I'm not asking you to do the impossible with no means. I'm asking you to do the impossible with the Holy Spirit. Remember, he's in you. When the person's driving too fast or too slow, whatever that is, the Holy Spirit's in me. You got to keep remembering that. Most of us have a trip to come to this church, and we will mess up our salvation just on the way to church. I mean, you, we got the first prayer we got to pray is, God, I'm, I don't know how many bad words I thought about that person. And what? And we, we want them, we should want them to come to church. We just want them to get out of our way. Most of the time, that's so doing your part is going to take, it says, live at peace. I love this one. Now, live at peace is a, is a combination. The first one is you got to make peace. It's like this live, this is not just acting like it's already there. You got to make it. So assume that it won't there. This is another word, cultivate. We spent like one year farming, and it was only one year because there's a whole lot of work to cultivate something. It's a bunch of time you got to wait for one watermelon. I'm just trying to tell you, it's a lot of work to get one little seed to grow into something that you can eat. Hallelujah that we have food lion. Man, I'm so glad. I tell them, I said, man, I love y'all so much. During COVID, every time people would be complaining, I said, whatever, they got food. And I would go to food lion and I'd make it work. Whatever they had, old manager special. That's I tell you, that's what my shopping list is. What's on sale and manager special? Because that's what you're eating this week. But anyway, you got to do your part to live at peace, to keep the peace. That's what it says. You got to assume something's going to try to take the peace, even if you made it, even if you cultivated it. We've had chickens for a long time. The chickens have been doing well. Something happened to the chickens. And then one chicken died and another chicken died, and you start doing stuff. You say, what is going on with the chickens? Keeping the peace is hard. A fox comes in. Then there's this other predator. You fix it for this. Then something else comes. Keeping the peace is hard. It's not just keeping it, but then it says you have to have it an action. This is an action, continuous action. So it's like you assume that something's going to always be coming, but it's also harmony. And I love this about harmony. I thought about this as we played. What you all liked is how that band played together, harmony. When there's, there's a simple melody, and all of us can sing the melody, right? But then somebody else comes in with something, and somebody else comes in with something. And when you hear that whole band, oh, it sounds so sweet. It's the same thing when we get this potluck. Aren't you so glad you didn't have to fix all of that food? Aren't you so glad that nobody said, hey, we got this homecoming thing coming up. I'm going to need about 50 servants of the next 48 things. You fixed one thing. All you brought was some of y'all didn't bring nothing. You brought a cup or, a, or you brought a cup to fill up for yourself. That's all. That's the only thing you're going to drink your own cup. And that's okay, too. That's okay, too, because this is what I love in the Bible. It says people went from stealing to giving to the poor. I love to see a transformation, but we got to be willing to live at peace with anybody and allow anybody to come in. So if you didn't bring nothing, don't feel ashamed. That's perfectly fine. There's enough chicken for you, too. And that's what this word peace is. It moves on. It says live at peace with everyone. That's all people, whosoever. But it's also all kinds 
of people. Yeah, I mean, like, there was a time where we could not have a church service with all of these people with tattoos. I just got to say it. There was a time where, I mean, it would have been a big deal. Look at all those folks. The pastors got it. The people say, we can live at peace with all kinds of people. This word, all, everyone, is two different words, though. It is basically all kinds of people, and it's all people. And so what I loved about this one, it's all humans, all men and women, but it's regardless of their weaknesses. See, there was a word connected to humans. It has to have something to do with God, right? So if we start our conversation with theology, we say, God is everything. He's so powerful. He, he's so wonderful. And we say, well, what about humans? We're like, well, they're not. And so like that's, that's, that's kind of like, so that's what humans is. It's like whatever it is, it ain't like God. Humans has some type of understanding that there are weaknesses, that there are sins. Some of us, I love this, Amanda said it this week, some of us wear them. Some of us have them in our identity, or we label them. And some of us, nobody knows it but the Lord. But all of us has those weaknesses and those sins. And so as we try to work with everyone, I love this, it also is connected to something. It said the human race. And I just love this one right here because the Bible says that there is one race of humans not black white and all these others now we can use it if you need it now if you need to call me i would much rather be considered a brown virginian but if you need to call me african-american that's fine. i've never been to africa but i mean like i've been, i've been to virginia my whole life i just i just i saw he called me a brown virginian because i but anyway with that we are one race and we have to remember that we are one race and so as we talking about it, I mean, man, well, all of us, that's where we are. We talking about coming home. Everybody ought to be able to be welcome home, right? It's who, guess who's coming to dinner? Anyway, now look, friends, do not avenge yourself. Man, I love it. He said some hard stuff. He's going to say some more hard stuff. So what do you put in the middle? Friends. I got to let you know. We are friends. I am not just trying to throw stuff out there. I love the people here. This is homecoming because I've been treated like family. And I hope you've been treated like family too. And if you haven't, tell us so we can work on that. That's what we should do. Now, I would just tell you, if you read about the families in the Bible, that's a lot of hard stuff. You know? I mean, the first family, murder, there's a whole bunch of stuff. So if the fact that nobody shot at you, I mean, is probably a good thing. But we are friends, dearly beloved favorite and that's what i've said before but we can have a favorite in every category you got three kids don't just have a favorite kid have three favorite kids you can say you are my favorite firstborn you are my favorite girl you are my favorite youngest kid right like that i got three favorites i got and each of them are my favorite in their own area that's god's got enough love to have it so live at peace but then we're moving to the second part which is forgive every sin so he says friends and he wants to tell you that you're worthy of love. That's what friend means, too. You're worthy of love, and you're worthy of esteem. Now, I need you friends to do this. I need you to see everybody else that same way. That's what all of the Bible is kind of trying to push us to see Jesus in every other human being. No matter what the sins, no matter what the hang-ups, no matter whatever those things are, and most of the hardest times for us to see that is when people have done something to hurt us. When someone has a political opinion different than ours, when their worldview is different than ours, those are the places where it's the hardest sometimes for us to love. And so what he says is do not avenge. Do not try to give revenge. But this, this word avenge is also this. Don't try to protect or defend or punish or even retaliate in every situation. Man, that's a hard one, especially in a marriage and in relationships. I mean, you know, when somebody says something and you got to respond, you just want to, ah, oh, I mean, just I want to stick it to them. You know, you know what I'm saying? Like, they got a little jab. You say, let's see if I can get an uppercut. This says, don't do that. That's the Bible. Don't avenge yourself, but leave room. Leave. This word means to give or to bestow a gift. That's where we've been talking the last few weeks. If you didn't see it, Paul's argument has been this. You have been given a bunch of gifts. 
And those gifts are not for you alone. Those gifts are to be used in the body. But Satan is going to try everything he can to keep you from separating yourself from the body. So your isolated gifts are all you're thinking about and all you're trying to use as opposed to being able to flourish working with everybody. And so that's why we're talking about coming home because some of us have to remember that the enemy has been whispering lies, these people love me. These people were nice. If you hear somebody say one bad word, Ecclesiastes tells you this, don't pay attention to everything everyone says because you will hear somebody say something bad. But then Ecclesiastes tells you this, the reason why you shouldn't get so upset is because you said something bad about somebody else. And you don't want everybody to bring back every word that you've ever said. So that's why we don't retaliate because we don't want well, what you said in August, right? I keep every text message, every email. I can pull you out my eighth grade paper. Like I'm just telling you right now, you need some on Hamlet, I got you, no problem. But I'm telling you, we got to throw away a lot of stuff and just like God does. The last point is to give like God. The Bible says he's thrown away stuff in the sea of forgetfulness. But we can go back and drag all that junk back out. And we can keep on going back. I know God gave it up, but I, I just want to keep it. So you got to make room. Room here is a marked space. That means you got to actually define it. You got to say, I'm hurt. I was talking to somebody today, and I was like, you know, one of the main problems is, is that we try to forgive sin sometimes, but we haven't defined why it was a sin. You know, because sometimes it wasn't a sin. Sometimes your feelings were just hurt. Y'all were two different people. They went about something differently than you. That person did not sin against you. You were just offended because they're different. Sometimes the other person did not sin. It was your sin. And you don't even discover that until once you start to say, what is the sin? It's like, oh, here is where it is. But when you've marked out that space, you also got to ask the question, this room is, is licensed. You got to say, now, who has the license to convict? Who has the license to punish? This is what the Bible tells us. There's two servants, and one servant owes the other servant a whole lot of money. And the other servant owes the master a whole lot of money. And when the master forgives the first servant, the reason why he's end up thrown into prison is because he's not being forgiven. We have to remember that everybody has a master. And we are nobody's master. All of us are the master's servants. And he is the only one who has the license to punish or to retaliate or to get back. The Bible says he will repay. He has wrath. He has good and bad stored up for people. You don't want to repay people good for all of the good things they've done for you. Now, that's why I'll tell you, you don't want to have to go back and count up every meal your mother ever cooked for you and then say, here's the bill right here, mama, right here. here I got a check for you for $7 million for every one of those. That's, I know, that's what you need to, hey, some of the mama said that won't cover it. Now, you got to go back to work, put an extra zero on there just to cover your breakfast, lunch, and dinner. We ain't talking about board. We just, so what I'm saying is this is what's so hard is we know that God is the only one who can pay. But then it says, I will repay, says the Lord. And that little, that little phrase at the end was something I said, I want to look up, says the Lord. Says, God is the one who's trying to teach us. He sent his Holy Spirit and his son, Jesus. Jesus told us a bunch of things that we forget, that we can't remember. So he gave us the Holy Spirit, and he said, the Holy Spirit will remind you the stuff that I taught you. So we got the Bible, we have Jesus, and we have the Holy Spirit, so we can be advised. We can have God's command. But this word says also means boast. The Lord is so happy to say, guess what? One day I'm going to take care of all of this. Don't worry about it. So many times in the Bible, people are taking that complaint to the Lord. Why is it that the wicked prosper? That, how You can see that in the Bible so many of the time. When you are in your heart, why is it that all of these people around me get new cars? And Why is it that all, what, all of those questions, they find themselves in the Scripture. 
And what I'm telling you is God's answer is always this like it was with Job. Who are you to question me? That's what God is on. He's like, listen, I, I got a day stored up. And he's shown it to Ezekiel. He's shown it to Daniel. He's shown it to Isaiah. He's shown it to John. But one day he's coming back. One day we will have that day where there will be sheep and there will be goats. There will be people on his right and people on his left. It's coming. But he said, let all of that stuff grow up together. And what we're supposed to be doing is trying to turn people from weeds into the blessings of Jesus Christ. We got, we got to cultivate the garden and live at peace, forgive every sin from the Lord, because this word Lord means master. We got to remember that he's coming back and he's going to ask each of his slaves what they did with his property, with his goods, with the gifts that he has given us. Our time, our talents, and our treasures are not our own. We have been given them by the one who owns us. And the word Lord means possessor, which means it's his. He's got the title, but it also means dispossessor. That means at any point in time, he can take somebody high and he can put them low. He can move them out of the equation altogether. And so if you think that your gifts and your talents have been given for you and you alone, or if you think that we cannot do without it, I just tell you the Lord can raise up somebody who is even better to do what he wants to be done we have to make room for the lord because god in the very end he tells us that if our enemy is hungry that we have to feed him we got to get to the place to where we are so in love with our brothers and sisters that we got enough love for even our enemies we talked about hospitality we're taking care of our brothers and sisters in christ we're taking care of strangers but now it says you got to go all the way to your enemy and it says if this word if is when so you need to know God wants you to do this you will have an enemy that you need to take care of some of those people are going to be our own parents that's that isn't that a hard thing somebody in your family never had a nice word to say to you and now they're in a condition and they and they need to stay in your house so, I mean, as we transition to, and some of us are in that place where our kids are getting a little bit older, and I've heard so many of y'all are in that season of life where you're having to take care of grandkids and aging parents. And some of the people who are hardest to love are not those little babies because they got the whole world left for them. They'll be all right. But you, those mean old people, some of y'all have mean old people to deal with. Let me tell you, I left college to take care of my great-grandfather. He had Alzheimer's and dementia. And the sweetest old man that I ever knew started threatening people with knives. He would get up in the middle of the night butt naked and want to fight. And that's, I'm just trying to tell you, I know some of our, we got real trials and tribulations, and we come in and we smile, and everything's all happy. Go, Man, life gets hard. Living at peace is hard. Forgiving every sin. Some of this is like, I know the Bible says honor my mother and my father, but oh, you're so rude to me, and especially. And you can be so nice to everybody else, and you're so mean to me. And I'm the one working so hard for you. And some of that is the reason why we got to say, who is our enemy? Who is being hateful? Somebody's being hateful to you. This word is odious, passively odious. Right? You ever had some of that? That's what I love. It was passively odious. Right? It's just like, it's just, you know, you pass gas and you, nobody knows who it was. And you just like kind of, that's what it is. And it, and, and it stinks up everything for everybody. And you know you did it. That's, that's passively odious. It's another word. It's actively hostile. Right? Some of us actually, we show up and we say, why didn't you serve my macaroni and cheese first? Don't you know that my macaroni and cheese is the best? I'm up. Uh, some of y'all got quiet. Y'all, how many macaroni and cheeses were broke this week? Nah, that's what, some of us are actively hostile. Some of us are passively odious. But whatever those things are, we got to recognize we've been the enemy a time or two. Go back to it. We, if we, if we got to forgive our enemy, it, it helps us if we remember that we were enemies of God, that he forgave every one of our sins, everything that we've ever thought and anything that we've ever done, 
And this is what, when we think about feeding the hungry, we think about how many times he took care of us in those years of our times of rebellion. So many people have said, I wouldn't be here today if my grandma wouldn't have prayed for me. If it wouldn't have been, how many of us were kept and taken care of for years in our rebellion and in our living for ourselves? We're talking about the prodigal son coming home. How many of us were those people who had to wake up one day and say, I'm sorry, guys? How many of us came home and never said, I'm sorry? And just started acting like everything <laughs> was just good. Like, how many of us need to go and start saying I'm sorry to some people? We're talking about giving like God. And this is what we've said before. No one can give anything to God. God has given us everything. But when we give like God, we give to people who don't deserve it. That's what the cross is, giving it to people who don't deserve it. It's feeding them. This word feeding means to nourish or to supply with bits of food into the mouth. It's very specific. You got to think of like the bird. This is a hard thing. When it's a, like you got to go through all of the extra labor of finding the food, of cultivating. That's how much work the Lord wants you to do for some of your spouses. I mean, this is a hard one, but when you talk about taking care of somebody else, it may take every part of you. It may take you all day long to, to carry it, to find enough food. And then not just to find the food, but then you got to prepare it and you got to give it to that person. You got to make sure that they, it's tolerable to them. And so what I'm telling you is to speak the truth in love. How you're feeding people, this word also means to give them, to irrigate the fields and to water the plants, to saturate the minds. It says if you're giving them water, you are not just throwing it out there. You're going to make sure it actually falls on good soil. I mean, I say the same thing to Deacon time after time and time again. The proverb says, a servant cannot be corrected by mere words. That means most of the time when you sit on the couch and you yell at your kid, that's why they don't stop. Because you got to get up. But I, I tell you, when I get in Deacon's face, he stops. Like, I mean, he stops right then. But he doesn't hear me when I'm on the couch. He can ignore me when I'm on the couch. So this is, you're going to have to get up and move towards somebody do something that may be hard. And this last word, heaping up fiery coals on that head, it means to pile up or to overwhelm, to load down. What the scriptures want us to do is to be so kind, to be so loving, to be so generous to people that when they think about saying something bad about us, that their consciences are weighed down and all they can think about is how many times that person has been nice to me. I love doing that in reconciliation. When two people have gotten mad at each other over something small, I just ask them, can we talk about all of the good things? And they just list thing after thing after thing after thing after thing. And that's what we have to do with our enemies. We got to give them good report after good report after good report. They say, how does he keep on smiling at me? Why does he keep on being nice to me? How is he able to keep on forgiving? It's because we have found a way to give like God. That's the only way we're going to heap up coals on their head. This last part says, but conquer evil with good. The word conquer here means to overcome, to get the victory. And it says that we can get the victory over the bad stuff, over the wrong stuff, over the destructive stuff. But we can only do that by doing what pleases God. We cannot fight the battle in just making a better argument. We actually have to do what pleases God. We're not trying to win people over with our words. We're trying to win people over with our lives. And so today what I'm asking you is that are you living at peace as the band comes up? Are you living at peace? Are you doing everything in your power to help people come back to the Lord, to come back home? to a loving, caring family. Are you forgiving every sin? Is there something that somebody's done to you this week? Just irritated you a little bit, and, and as the week went on, just kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And you said something to somebody on the phone about it, and you told somebody at work about it, and you said somebody at Food Line about it, but you still haven't said anything to the person who upset you. We're talking about forgiving every sin. Have we have have we said, hey, I'm I'm upset about the way that you talked to me or about the thing that you did. And I've 
Have we just said sorry for the things that we have done? Last thing is, have we tried to see how much we've been given by God, how generous he has been to us, and then to be adequate in our kindness to others? Today I'm asking you if you are ready to go home. Are you ready for the Lord to come back and to say, have you done what I've called you to do? We're just talking about love and forgiveness here. But it starts with those who you're closest to. And we're talking about a family. We're talking about a church. So I ask you, have you got it right with your husband, with your wife, with your kids, with those that you love the most? As I pray, I ask if there's anyone who wants to come and give their life to Christ, the prayer team will be forward. And if there's anyone who needs special prayer, if there's anyone who just says, I'm, I'm still holding on to something. I just, I need to get it right. This is about coming home to the Father who forgives everything. Let us pray. God, we thank you right now that you have gotten us ready. You are the one who told us what we're supposed to do. You gave us your word. You gave us your son, Jesus, and you've given us your Holy Spirit. So we have enough to do the things that you've called us to do. We can live at peace. We can make it. We can cultivate it. And we can keep it. We can forgive those who have harmed us because, God, we know that we have been forgiven. And, God, we can give whatever you've called us to give, whether it be our time or our resources, we can feed and take care of other people. We can nourish them no matter how hard it is. Because, God, you have already supplied our every need. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen.
more time through Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. How once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. Was blind, but now I see. Amen. Amen. Can we give an Annie off thank you for this band worshiping with us this morning? Now, before I pray for our food and close out, uh, I want to remind everybody that we're going to have a cemetery, uh, cemetery meeting. Uh, everyone is welcome, and we're also going to have food in just a little bit. Now, let us pray. God, thank you so much for this opportunity to come and worship you. Now, we thank you for calling us home and for giving us a place that one day we will live with you forever. And God, we ask right now that you would bless this food, all the hands that prepared it, all the mouths that's going to eat it up. In Jesus Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Go in his peace.